Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this special edition of Webinar Wednesday, Navigating the COVID-19 Pandemic from the 911 Center. My name is Chris Nussman. I'm the Innis Communications Director and your MC this afternoon. I'll be turning things over to our presenters in just a second, but before we get started, a few notes of housekeeping. We are recording this webinar, so if you miss any part of it, want to watch it again or share it with your coworkers or colleagues, you'll be able to do so. We'll automatically send you a link to the on-demand archive, as well as a PDF copy of the slide deck shortly after we finish our live broadcast. They'll also both be posted to Nina's COVID-19 resource page at nina.org slash COVID-19. And of course, uh, with this important topic, we want you to get as much of this webinar, uh, get as much out of this webinar as possible. So if you have any questions during the presentation, just enter them in the GoToWebinar interface, and we'll answer as many as we can towards the end of the hour. With that, I'm going to turn things over to our first presenter, John Kelly. Thanks, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, Grateful Dead a, a long, long time ago said, uh, what a long, strange trip it's been. And I think all of us that are working through the uh, advent of COVID-19 are finding it to be a long, strange trip. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to talk about the impact of COVID-19 in a number of different ways in, in the 911 Center. I'm going to start out talking about um, some of the impacts of what a declaration of emergency means. I, I don't think any of us in our lifetime have lived through an emergency quite like this. We may have had perhaps a local emergency, weather related or some other kind of, of uh, issue in your local community, but they have a national state and in most places, local emergencies declared pretty much uniformly across the country. I don't think we've been there. So there's a lot of things all of us are finding out on a day by day, almost hour by hour basis. So we're gonna talk about what an emergency means. We're gonna talk about how it impacts you in the center. And probably most importantly, we're gonna try and talk specifically about some of the ways this COVID-19 is impacting you in the, in the 911 center. Um, we're gonna uh, particularly focus today on um, uh, HR related uh, issues in your center because that seems to be a majority of the questions that are being asked. However, as Chris indicated, we're willing to take uh, uh, questions about almost any topic, again, related to COVID-19 and, and the declaration of emergency that, that you may have. Um, so the national emergency was declared by, by, the, by the president and I think uh, probably in many of your states, you have had your governor declare a state of emergency. What exactly is a state of emergency? A state of emergency is, is a legal declaration made by um, the uh, ultimate executive authority, whether it be the president of the United States, perhaps the governor of your state, or on a local basis, the mayor, village president, county board uh, uh, chairman, whatever it might be in your individual jurisdiction, that provides certain um, emergency powers to the government to do things that they might not otherwise be able to do absent that declaration of emergency. So we've seen things like uh, the shelter in place or, or the stay at home orders. Those are all as a result of the declaration of emergency. Uh, some states have, have taken to uh, taking over property, um, perhaps school property, uh, uh, hotel properties, uh, other kinds of public or private properties that they can use for the benefit of, of taking care of the people be, that are ill because of the uh, virus. Um, we've got business and school closures, again, ordered by the state uh, in most cases. Um, in some states, we've had suspension of other kinds of, of state rules. I know here in Illinois, we have an Open Meetings Act that mandates that um, meetings, uh, public meetings be held uh, in public and with the opportunity for people to attend. Uh, the governor here in Illinois last week issued an order that allows public bodies to conduct their meetings, meetings electronically to try to maintain the social distancing that's so important in, in staving off the effects of this um, environment. Additionally, we've seen guidance from uh, the United States Department of Justice Office of Civil Rights, and that guidance specifically speaks to uh, the Health, uh, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, an act you may know as HIPAA, and it makes allowances for um, 911 centers to use uh, co coronavirus, COVID-19 information to transmit that information to their uh, uh, public safety officers in the field. Specifically, the uh, uh, Office of Civil Rights says a 911 call center may ask screening questions of all callers, for example, their temperature, 
or whether they have a cough or difficulty breathing to identify potential cases of COVID-19, and to the extent that the call center may be a HIPAA-covered entity, and again, I would remind you that most of you are not HIPAA-covered entities, but if you are, the call center is permitted to inform a police officer being dispatched uh, of, of this information. And, and those are just a few of the examples that um, have come about with the uh, uh, different declarations of emergency on the varying levels across the country. Chris, if we can move to the union contract slide. So many of you may have union contracts in your dispatch center. And in, in union contracts, there's typically specific language that allows the employer to uh, waive or, or to relax certain provisions of the contract. For instance, an example would be in the event of a civil emergency, which may include, but is not limited to, riots, civil disorders, tornado conditions, floods, or other emergencies as may be declared by the authority, um, the director or his or her designee may suspend the provisions of this agreement regarding shift time, callback procedures, scheduling, and leave time, provided that the wage rates and monetary benefits shall not be suspended and providing that all of the provisions of this agreement shall promptly be reinstated once the civil emergency condition ceases to exist. Now, again, this, this language might be in your union contracts or something similar to it, but even if you don't have a union contract, there is, again, general authority under these declarations of emergency to allow for uh, some uh, changes in the way you do business. And we could jump to the next slide, Chris. So what, what are some of those things? Well, for instance, altering work schedules. So if, if you find that your center um, is hit by the coronavirus, uh, that, that you've got uh, a number of your employees that are needed to be uh, quarantined or off of work because of actually being diagnosed, can you change your work schedule? Can you go to a 12-hour schedule? Can you drop your minimum staffing? Yes, you can do all of those things. Again, under this authority granted either through your union contract or through your local declaration of emergency. Can you limit time off? And again, the question is absolutely. The, the overtime requirements of the Fair Labor Standards Act have not been relaxed. So that if your employees are working more than 40 hours in a seven day period, you're still gonna have to pay overtime. But you can move people's schedules around. You can do things like cancel vacations. If again, the um, uh, anticipation is that you might be short staffed during this emergency, you do have the authority to either deny a time off or cancel vacations. Uh, some questions have been asked about, can I limit my employee's ability to travel? I, since ne none of the declarations of emergency that I'm aware of have any travel limitations, I don't know that if an employee has um, off, off time, time off, that they have previously scheduled and that you have not canceled, I don't know that you can limit them from traveling. Um, but if you are in a situation where you're short staffed, then I think you probably can place limitations on traveling. And that would be based on your need to have some immediate response if uh, staffing levels fall to a minimum or if people are unavailable to staff the center. Um, another uh, question that's come up frequently in the past couple of weeks is, can I limit secondary employment? Uh, many 911 uh, center dispatchers uh, work frequently in the uh, emergency, other emergency services. Uh, a lot of people work perhaps in an EMT or EMS ca capability. Uh, can you as the 911 center director limit that kind of secondary employment? My answer is yes. Again, look to your union contract or perhaps your policy on secondary employment or even to the uh, declarations of emergency to limit secondary employment, particularly if that secondary employment would result in your employee being uh, having greater uh, exposure to perhaps uh, coronavirus or any other um, illness for that matter. So those are some of the things that you can do uh, based on your abilities uh, under either, like I say, the union contract emergency provisions or an emergency declaration made by your governor or your uh, local mayor or, or village president. Okay, it's my turn, this is April. Um, 
it is recommended that you have a continuity of operations plan or COOP in place. Uh, COOP addresses emergencies from an all hazards approach. It establishes policy and guidance, ensuring that critical functions continue and that personnel and resources are relocated in an alternate facility um, in cases of emergency. The plan should develop procedures for alerting, notifying, activating and deploying employees, identifying critical business functions, establishing an alternate facility, a roster of personnel with authority and knowledge of function. The COOP should also include uh, purpose, scope, situations, and assumptions. The plan itself then describes the steps to be taken in every stage of the operation, including monitoring the situation, elevating situational conditions, conditions getting worse, and emergency declaration. It should include functional annexes that incorporate essential functions like facilities, uh, communications, and succession planning. Some of the specific items to ensure your plan covers are the limitation of visitors and or even locking down your facility, backup plans, how you're going to handle operations during the cleaning of your facility if it is contaminated, testing your backups before you have to initiate them, which includes testing equipment such as your to-go phones and CAD in a remote environment if that is one of the things you plan to use. During this time, it is more important than ever that you work with your surrounding agencies and backups before you have to call them and say, we're going to we're bugging out of here, we're coming your way, or we're switching our calls to you. We currently have two functioning coops up on our nina.org forward slash COVID-19 website that you can use as examples. And I'd like to give a big thank you to both Charleston County Consolidated 911 Center and DuPage Public Safety Communications for their leadership in providing the coops for examples for other PSAPs to use. If you've already been monitoring our resource page, you'll likely have noticed that the COOPs have, been, have gone through a couple of different updates themselves. If you have resources you think may be valuable, please send them to me at a, April Hein, or I'm sorry, let's try that again, a Heinze at nina.org. That's A H E I N Z E at nina.org. And we'll work to get them posted. We appreciate everyone who has already provided the resources to date, and these resources are definitely becoming invaluable tools for all of us. All right, so I, I think it's back to me, and I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about some of the issues that are that I know all of you are dealing with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in your centers. In, in my uh, law practice, I represent you know, 40 or 45 911 centers across the state of Illinois, and I've had these very questions coming from uh, people in, in the centers uh, like you, and so we're going to try and deal with some of those. Um, first of all, can, can we uh, can we take an employee's temperature when they report to work? For most of my uh, guidance on these topics, I'm going to point you to the pandemic preparedness in the workplace uh, document, which is a guidance released by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, and it's specifically ADA guidance during the terms of, during the times of the pandemic. Uh, that resource is available either from the EEOC or I think that's another resource that Nina has in its uh, resource COVID-19 resource guide that April just referred to. Uh, and, and the question about taking temperatures is absolutely yes. Um, the guidance from the EEOC says that because of the threat analysis uh, brought along by the prospect of COVID-19, the ADA requirements relative to what might otherwise be medical tests are somewhat relaxed, and specifically as to the taking of uh, uh, body temperature. Now, um, ordinarily, that would be viewed as a medical test of which we probably couldn't do in the workplace. But given the nature of this disease and the importance of, of making sure that our employees, number one, are not sick, but also number two, are not um, um, conducting the virus, that we can take those temperatures. Now, a couple of cautions with that or with any of the 
uh, things that I'm going to talk about next. Number one, if you as a center determined to take temperatures, you must do it for all employees and all the time. Uh, if we don't, we then run the risk of uh, discrimination. So then we have to defend why we did certain people's temperatures or why we didn't. Now, if we want to base that decision on reported symptoms or other kinds of manifestations of the virus, that might be okay. But my, my recommendation to you is if you're going to take temperatures, do it for everybody every day, all the time. The second caution about this information and about the information you might gather from your employees regarding their physical condition is that this information, like all health information, must be protected. It should be confidential. Access to the information should be limited so that only those people who really need to know, maybe the director, maybe the assistant director, should know about the temperature taking, about the results, and about what uh, directions are given to an employee who might test with an above normal body temperature. Again, this is a protected health information. Uh, we should give, the ADA does require privacy and we should give that privacy to that information. In terms of sick calls, can you ask employees about the nature of their illness? And again, generally the advice is we can ask very limited questions when an employee calls in sick. Perhaps uh, the law allows us, even prior to the, to the coronavirus epidemic, the law allows us to ask uh, the nature of the illness and how long it's going to last. And those are allowed strictly for planning purposes. Well, with the, the COVID-19 and the additional impact it's going to have on staffing your center, the uh, EEOC has said we can ask questions similar to, are you experiencing flu-like symptoms? Do you have aches? Do you have a fever? Do you have chills? Do you have a cough or sore throat? Those are all symptoms of uh, the, the coronavirus. And again, the EEOC has allowed to, during this time, to ask those questions so that you in the management of your workforce can determine whether or not that person might be someone who is um, um, possibly going to be affected by the virus. And importantly, what contact has that person had with the people in your center? Um, can we send an ill employee home? And the answer is absolutely yes. And again, the ADA, uh, the EEOC in this ADA guidance tells us that if an employee is sick, you absolutely have the right to send them home. Now, what happens when we send them home? Well, first of all, they should be using sick leave if you're sending them home. They're sick, we're sending them home, we charge them with their sick leave. Uh, my, my experience has been that some of the uh, um, em employee unions don't necessarily see it that way, but my advice is that if an employee is, is found to be sick in the workplace, uh, that employee should be sent home and sick leave should be charged for that. Now, what if the employee is at home and calls in sick? Well, that's a, a sick call, just the same as any other sick call. With the direction to go home, I think the employee certainly has to be told to number one, see their physician, and number two, follow their physician's recommendations relative to any uh, self-quarantine or further testing for uh, uh, COVID-19. Um, so, so those are some of the things that you can do with your employees in the center. Um, now, again, I have to stress and remind you that it's important that you apply these uh, conditions across your workforce totally, not just one particular person or one particular shift, but across your workforce totally to avoid any um, allegations of discrimination. Um, I think we could go to the next slide then, Chris, uh, and that I think uh, Jameson will be picking it up from here. Thanks, John Nabel. I appreciate that. You know, the CDC has put out quite a few things about workplace health precautions, um, and we encourage you to continue to follow those, uh, hand washing and sanitizing, both of the, of the person in their hands and also the workplace. Um, you can look up a lot of these things, the EEOC preparedness in the workplace memo. It's updated this past March 21, and I believe that's also up on the COVID-19 website at NINA. So I kind of want to segue into a few things that uh, specific to the 911 Center uh, about 
things that we should be looking at in our cosmetic cleaning. So Chris, go to the next slide, please. And we know that uh, our shared surfaces are probably where we transmit most of our bacteria and viruses. Uh, the keyboards, the mice, the phones, the headsets inside of our comm center are just breeding grounds. But as we continue to clean moving forward, we need to also focus on chairs, uh, both the top sides and the underneath the chairs, consoles, the filing cabinets and drawers, particularly when we have filing cabinets that have uh, recessed handle pulls, so that you make sure you get underneath the handle pulls also while you're cleaning because that's where the fingertips go. And of course, we know bathrooms and lockers, but also doors, doorways, uh, any place where we might have keypad entry, uh, those type of things, we need to make sure that we're cleaning those on a regular basis. And if you're lucky enough in your comm center to have uh, some type of appliance to the kitchen, definitely keep that place clean. I uh, know how much we love the refrigerator and the microwave. So um, those things are probably things that we might look over. So let's make sure we hammer those home in the coming weeks. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about taking care of our team. Uh, post 9-11, most of our public safety teams endured incredible stress, both in the professional and the personal lives. And we learned a lot of lessons post 9-11. And we kind of curtailed those lessons a little bit or, or craft those lessons a little bit through Hurricane Michael, Hurricane Harvey, uh, and then local disasters like the tornadoes we saw here in Nashville last month, uh, wildfires we've seen out west. And what we found is that the influences uh, of these major incidents, coupled with that 24 7 news cycle, really weighs heavily on our telecommunicators. Uh, they come to work, they're, they're kind of drowning inside of that uh, disaster. And then secondly, when they go home, they're drowning in as well with 24-7 news cycle. So one of the things we talked about uh, part of this call was maybe this time for us to work on limiting the amount of news coverage inside the Peace app. Uh, we saw this kind of after 9-11 where folks said, you know what, we're not going to watch 24-7 on the monitors in the Peace app. We're going to watch something a little differently so we can focus on our job function and maybe kind of disconnect a little bit. But let's talk about a few other ways that we could help take care of our team. Next slide, please, Chris. You've seen a lot about remote work, uh, and I know that in 911, that's very difficult for us sometimes to understand that we have some agencies and, or some person that could remote work during this time frame. And it's not forever, right? It's again, we're limiting exposure, and we're trying to come up with some policies to help us with that. So, a few of the places that we could limit uh, or have remote work policies in place administration, uh, our GIS folks. Uh, IT services, if you're lucky enough to have those in your comm center. If you have folks who are just doing quality assurance, uh, that are, that's their position, or if they're doing it for that entire day, they can work for that entire day remotely doing QA, and any clerical staff. Uh, as we start looking at hosted solutions that we have kind of inside the, um, the comm centers currently with hosted CAD and call handling equipment, we have seen some folks who've been able to take the call ticking element uh, into the comm center and take the calls in the comm center, limit that exposure with fewer folks actually present, and then remote people who are doing the dispatch function can use uh, hosted CAD environment to be able to dispatch those calls out. Uh, very similar to what we've done for many, many years with the MDTs or their officers. Thirdly, we can look at the deploying backup PSAPs, uh, and there are two thought processes to this. Uh, one is we use the backup PSAP uh, as a sterile environment. So that if we do have some type of exposure inside of our comm center, we can immediately pick up our staff, move to the backup site, sit down, go to work, and then we can come in and clean the primary piece app. Secondly, we also could split our, uh, um, our agency up into two different sections. So let's say we have a 12-hour shift. We want Alpha shift to work completely out of the primary piece app, but Bravo shift, we want you to work in the backup piece app. So we have some separation there to be able to keep the two people apart in case we do have some type of infection going on. Uh, many folks who don't have the capability of having a backup piece that might have an EOC or a training room or a mobile command unit at their disposal, uh, particularly in the rural areas of America. I've seen uh, people who are deploying their mobile vehicles or setting up call taking positions, again, keeping those sterile just in case something happens when it's not the primary piece out so they have a place they can go to. Uh, mobile command also could be used if you wanted to just move out of the PSAP for a few hours, bring in a clean crew once a day, clean top to bottom. And there's also the, the side effect or benefit of having your comm center staff actually outside enjoying the sunshine. Lastly, a temporary uh, site sharing, and I'll kind of group in the alternate sites and routing. 
as we begin seeing the heavier impacts uh, on scheduling for uh, telecommunicators, we may find a point where we can't actually staff 24-7. Uh, and there are two ways we can we can kind of work that process out. April hit on it earlier about going ahead now and talking to your surrounding agencies to say, hey, we may have to evacuate or we may not have the people in place to take care of this. Uh, alternate routing right now gives us the ability to say, you know what, beyond 10 p.m. tonight, we're going to actually shunt all of our calls to, to a neighboring agency, let them take those to 6 a.m. because it's a very low call volume, and we can really focus on serving our community during the daylight hours. So that's that's it kind of makes me cringe a little bit because we're supposed to be there 24-7, but if the staffing issues get to a level to where we can effectively staff, that may be one of the solutions that we can implement for a very short time frame. Secondly, temporary site sharing. Maybe we do a temporary regionalization where we co-locate with a neighboring piece out. Now, this may increase exposure, but it gives us a temporary fix to answering our calls. And all of these different uh, solutions here, I encourage you to work with your IT department today. Start talking about ways that you can actually uh, implement these policies. Now, if you're from a small piece app, medium sized piece app like, like I am, and you kind of giggle when I said IT department, reach out to your vendors. The majority of the vendors that we have right now in the 911 space are more than willing to help get through this issue. Maybe it's setting up uh, additional call taking positions or cab positions uh, for a very short time frame on your current contract and say, you know what, we'll just we'll help you with this. They're they're a part of our family as well. And we want to make sure that they are there with us working together. So next slide, Chris. Now, uh, one-on-one -on -one with your staff, I encourage you uh, to keep checking in with your people. Uh, and, if, and if you don't take anything out, out of this uh, slide deck of my piece here, this one statement about setting aside time to check on your team, uh, not only as managers or supervisors, but also just on your coworkers. Block out time on your schedule, put an, put an alarm in your phone, uh, do something that says, for this 15 minutes, I'm going to reach out to my coworkers and make sure they're doing okay. Ask them specifically open-ended questions. How are you holding up? How, how's your family doing? Are there any uh, concerns you have about your family both living with you or family that may be in the area that you need to take care of? And start identifying maybe some unmet needs they may have. We saw this in Hurricane Harvey with our folks down in Texas did a tremendous job of setting up a point of distribution just for public safety where they were meeting the needs of formula, diapers, non-perishable food items, uh, even clothing and bedding uh, post-Harvey. Then we can have that same mindset today when we start working on checking on our people. Next slide. Now, we've been through a lot of major incidents in most of our peace outs, but maybe a, a local emergency or some type of disaster declaration. But to be honest with you, this is probably gonna have a bigger impact on our daily, daily lives uh, that we haven't seen since 9-11. Uh, and we have to be very vigilant in taking care of ourselves, and I'll tell you why. Today, the folks who are working seconds and third shifts, when the kids are out of school, it's it's like when they're home for the summer break, but it's a little different because we're not allowed to leave. They can't go out and play in the neighborhood. They can't run up and down the street like they usually do, so we're stuck in the house with them. <laughs> that lends to us also cooking more and, and trying to, you know, make carve out time for that to make sure we have that uh, completed before we have to go to work when we get home from work. We can't just say, you know what, I've, it's been a little busy today and let's just run out and grab something to eat. We're also cleaning more, uh, trying to make sure that we're taking our house, uh, keeping that in order. And uh, if you ever try to clean with small kids, you know what chore that is. And now we're also talking about working more. And so we're talking about, you know, maybe move from eight to 10 to 12 to 14 hour shifts because we're trying to ramp up this disaster level event. All of those things. All those things, the personal life, affect our professional performance. So it's very important that we are vigilant in our sleep cycles, uh, watching out for our diet, making sure that we are exercising in some form or fashion to remove those stress hormones that we have inside of our body, and keeping an eye on our medications. Two things here. One, prescription meds. Uh, I have high blood pressure, and so I make sure that I have like a 30 or 45-day supply but also meds that we may have or need when we're sick, such as ibuprofen, Tylenol, Mucinex, et cetera, to make sure we already have those in place. As leaders, affirmation and accountability in our stress management policy is very important. Hey, you're doing a great job. I really appreciate you being here. I, I thank you so much for you know showing up today and having a good attitude. I know this is very stressful. The accountability piece is, you know what, Jameson, I saw you signed up for four overtime shifts this week. I appreciate how much you're committed to us, but you've got to take care of yourself. And we're only going to let you work two of those because we want you to get rest and sleep. 
as the process continues, make sure they understand that there are, there are uh, resources available to them through EAP. And I would encourage you as a manager or a leader to put that together in an email and send that information once a week to all your staff. Just a reminder, here's something, if you have uh, financial issues, reach out to employee assistance. If you have questions about you know, anxiety, reach out to employee assistance. Here are some other resources. Because they may not come to you thinking that, you know, well, now's not the time. Everybody's suffering. I don't want to bring it up. Have those resources there at their fingertips and push them out. And then peer support. Now, roving peer support teams are probably, you know, kind of uh, shut down right now, but we can't have peer support inside our own comm center about issues. Um, on Nina's Continuum website, there is a great document called the Post-Tragedy Care Checklist. I highly encourage you to go download that, uh, take a look at that. Um, and what that does, it helps you create a, um, a sense of scheduling around how you take care of your team should one of them become sick or maybe a loss of one of their family members or even a loss of an employee and how you work through that process. I wish I'd had this about eight years ago. We lost one of our telecommunicators to the flu. Uh, and it felt like for weeks we just kind of mosey around the dark trying to find our way and that post tragedy care checklist would have been so beneficial for our staff and you can amend that uh, that policy or that checklist to say how do I reach out and keep in contact with my folks at the comm center today and all of these things that we've talked about communication is going to be the force multiplier you need to have constant communication it's relevant communication and make sure it's always supportive communication we are a team, we are a family working together on this. Next slide, please. Just a reminder, it is still legal to enjoy the sunshine. Just wanted you to know that. I know that some of the folks in our urban areas may not be able to get outside and go up and down the street, but definitely go to the window, open the window, stick your head out and scream. Um, but if you're in a rural area like I am, try to be outside, try to enjoy some of that sunshine, even if it's on your, your own yard, your own porch, whatever it may be. It's also still legal to laugh and experience joy. Uh, I'm, I would love to see the, the ratio right now of CDC post on Facebook to meme post on Facebook. So I think it's pretty even, but it's definitely still legal to laugh and experience joy. And conversely, it's also still legal to have it come apart. And that's my term for, you know what? It's just too much and we're having an emotional breakdown moment because it is, I feel like the weight of the world is on our shoulders right now in 911. And we have to carry that burden. And it's okay to have a moment that says, you know what? I'm just struggling. Following up to that, we got into this to help others in need. It is still legal for us to help others in need, including our own, and specifically our own, to make sure reaching out to them. Next slide. And lastly, I'll close up my piece saying that what happens when someone does get sick inside of my comp center? Um, in public safety, we have this um, mentality, and I don't think we mean to, but when someone is out for surgery for six or eight weeks, or maybe they're out sick, or they're traveling, whatever else, Sometimes we don't really check up on them because we keep our head in the game and when we come to work and we think about them, we're so focused on the work task in front of us that we forget to reach out to them. So I encourage you, if you do have someone get out sick because of family or themselves, keep up that communication. Keep saying, keep in mind, you're still able to get EAP resources. Here's where you're at on your sick leave. What can we do for you? How can we help out? Are there needs that you have? Um, can we bring by food or can we, can we go get you some formula for the baby? What can we do to help you in this? Keep reaffirming to them, you are still part of the team. You are a valued part of our team, and we want to make sure that you are well and you come back to work with us. And most importantly, probably all of this, is make sure that we stick to those return to work guidelines. If you don't have what those currently in place, start working on those. And now we're one, we, we are also focused on getting back to the office and making sure that we're there to help out in times of need. Sometimes we come back way too soon. Uh, I, I was probably one of the worst proponents of this where you might still be running a little bit of a fever, not feeling great, but I want to get back in there and help out because I don't want to leave my teammates hanging. We've had, we have to have solid return to work guidelines because we want to protect not only the employee and their family, but we also have to protect our industry, protect our house and make sure that we have people there and we don't want to spread the virus or the sickness throughout our entire agency. So develop those return to work guidelines, stick to them. The virus doesn't care which position you're working in, your return to work guidelines, don't care what position you work in either. We all work with the same guidelines. Now I'm gonna turn it back over to John. Yes, sir. Thanks, Jameson. Um, yes, a couple of follow-ups on some of the things that Jameson said. Now, number one, I, I, I would also stress that return to work guidelines. Importantly, if you've had a occasion of a employee diagnosed with a coronavirus, make sure that you get uh, that medical release from his or her doctor 
uh, evidencing their ability to return to work. And, and the same would be true if you've got people who may have um, been quarantined um, or had uh, medical uh, situations that might not have tested positive, you still want to get that um, um, release from their doctor. And, and following up on Jameson's um, importance of this point, please think about a return to work protocol. This is something you should have in policy, perhaps have a questionnaire to ask the, each employee who may have been affected by this disease or other illness, uh, certain questions that evidence their ability to not only return to work in their good health, but in also protecting the, the good health and safety of the employees in your center. Um, what, what happened, before I move into talking about the recently enacted federal legislation, a, a couple of things that have come out in terms of what happens when you have a uh, employee who uh, tests positive for the coronavirus. Um, as Jameson indicated, uh, you know, cleaning the center is going to be most important. Um, I've had one client who had to make room in their center for uh, employees of another center who did have an employee test uh, a positive for the coronavirus. Um, things had been practiced, and it was a relatively smooth switchover to move a couple of employees from one center into our center. Uh, the, uh, the other center then deep cleaned their center, and they were back up and running the next day. But think about these things. Prepare for these things. Be ready to know where can you go or can we accept uh, a couple of people from another center to uh, assist in that. Um, employees who have had contact, if, if you have an employee diagnosed, if you've got employees that have had contact with that employee and as much as we try to maintain social distancing, uh, it's a re usually a relatively compact environment in the 911 center. Uh, you may want to uh, quarantine those employees that perhaps work the same shift with that employee. Those employees should probably be tested. And again, testing is going to be a uh, product of both their individual physical or physician's recommendation and what your Department of Health, whether it's state or local Department of Health, is doing in, the, in terms of testing. I know some Departments of Health are setting aside specific testing uh, kits and areas for uh, public safety personnel, if that's available where you are, you may want to take advantage of that. Finally, somebody asked the question, what happens if I work in a, in, a, in a center that knows that one of the employees had the coronavirus, was diagnosed, and doesn't tell the other employees? Well, first and, and, and foremost, I don't think that's a center we really um, uh, probably want to work in. I, I think employers have an obligation and certainly under the declarations of emergency and the guidance from the uh, CDC and your local Department of Health, that is information that the employees have a right to know. From the employer's perspective, I think that that kind of behavior could lead to workers' compensation claims against the center because, again, if the, if the uh, uh, center didn't do everything in its power to try and prevent other employees from catching the virus, I think that could possibly be viewed as as part of a workers' compensation claim. And if you are an employee who is aware of that situation, I think you can inform your local health department of that so that the public health authorities can get involved. Now I'm gonna move on uh, and talk a little bit about uh, HR 6201, a, a bill that was passed by the United States Congress um, recently and was signed into law by President Trump on, on March the 18th. Uh, a lot has been made about this law, and, and one of the first things I want to address is the applicability of this law to uh, public safety personnel. The law itself uh, provides, um, both in the emergency sick leave area and in the extension of the Family and Medical Leave Act, FMLA benefits, that this law is not mandatorily applicable to emergency responders. That's the exact wording of the law. Now the question has come, does that apply to 911 center personnel? And I think some of us uh, hearkening back to the battle that is ongoing with the Office of Management and Budget over the classification of uh, 911 center professionals as first responders think that, that perhaps that eliminates the um, uh, waiver of, the, of this law. I really don't think that it does, and here's why. Uh, the term emergency responder is not defined in HR 6201. So when it's not defined, we should look around to what other federal laws say. The 
uh, Department of uh, Homeland Security, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, uh, released a memo on March 19th that, that classifies 911 center employees specifically called out as critical infrastructure industry under the terms of the president's uh, d disaster uh, declaration. So we've got Department of Homeland Security uh, saying that you are critical infrastructure. Furthermore, in the United States Department of Transportation regulations under the Federal Railway Administration, that term emergency responder is defined. And there it says a member of a police or fire department or other organization involved with public safety and charged with providing or coordinating emergency services. And certainly that fits our 911 uh, community. So under the terms, I'd say emergency responder as the uh, uh, Department of Transportation uh, rules define it, I think you are emergency responders. And furthermore, if you look at the uh, uh, Federal uh, Emergency Management Authority, the FEMA um, statute, you see that there they define as an emergency response provider. Now it's not emergency provider, but it's emergency response provider as a um, federal, state, and local governmental and non-governmental emergency, public safety, fire, law enforcement, emergency response, emergency medical, including hospital emergency facilities, and all related personnel agencies and authorities. A very broad definition that again, I think would encompass the inclusion of uh, 911 center personnel. So for those reasons, I think that the definition of emergency responder in uh, HR 6201 does include uh, 911 center personnel, which then makes the application of this bill um, voluntary on the part of governmental employers. And I do stress that, that it's voluntary, that you don't have to apply it. And, and the question comes up, if we have to give this benefit, particularly the um, Family and Medical Leave Act extension benefit, it could cripple our centers. I had a, a director say she's got eight out of 10 employees who have uh, children who are home from school because their schools are closed. And if all of them were able to uh, use that Family and Medical Leave Act uh, extension application of, of HR 6201, she would be without any employees. And, and certainly that is not the intention of the, of the act. So uh, summer, a brief summary of these acts, uh, uh, Section C of the, of the uh, HR 6201 provides two weeks of emergency paid sick leave for uh, employees to use under very specific circumstances. And, and, and those include employees who are quarantined, who are suffering the effects of COVID-19, or for caring for children um, uh, or someone in isolation because of school closures or child care unavail unavailability. The act provides that up to 80 hours at full pay can be used for the um, uh, sick leave for um, the quarantine or the um, treatment for COVID-19. Up to two thirds of the employee's pay for 80 hours can be used for the uh, uh, care of someone home from school. Uh, the second provision of the act, uh, section E of the act, uh, provides some additional Family and Medical Leave Act benefits. Uh, um, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the Family and Medical Leave Act, but as you know, it's an act that provides up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave in certain uh, conditions. Well, the Congress, through HR 6201, has extended that application to include up to 12 weeks of leave for uh, parents who need to care for children due to, and that's children under the age of 18, due to school closures or child care unavailability. It's important to note that this FMLA extension is not for uh, treating the COVID-19 or for quarantine. It's solely for the uh, child care need. And in that case, uh, two weeks, the first two weeks are unpaid, uh, up to 10 weeks then would be paid at two thirds uh, pay, but not more than $200 per day. Now, an employee could use the uh, two weeks of additional paid sick leave granted by Section C of uh, HR 6201 to cover those first two weeks, that's up to you and the, uh, uh, and the employee. Um, I've had a lot of questions 
say, how is this going to work? Well, unfortunately, this was rushed through so quickly. We don't have uh, a lot of guidance. Um, the Department of the United States Department of Labor has 15 days to um, uh, um, pro promulgate emergency rules that may give us some additional uh, understanding how this is going to work. And, and remember that this act does not become effective until April the 2nd, uh, because there was a time limit after the president's signature for it to be implemented. So we'll have to stay tuned to uh, Nina and other resources to find out more about how this act is actually going to work. One further thing before I turn it over to April is that the Department of Labor is requiring that all employers post a notice regarding these benefits in your area, in your uh, PSAP, where you post similar types of notices, FLSA, or FMLA, uh, discrimination notices, other notices that the government requires you to post, you are going to have to post one uh, uh, regarding the provisions of uh, HR 6201, and the Department of Labor is supposed to, again, have a uh, suggested guidance on that posting uh, within the next 15 days. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back to April. Okay, thanks, John. Um, the National 911 Office is coordinating a group of national 911 organization stakeholders in an effort to ensure we are pulling together the resources that our 911 community needs right now. Nina truly appreciates having a seat at that table, which gives our membership the ability to have their voices heard. We are looking at all aspects of how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting our public safety, more specifically, how it's affecting our PSAPs and working to get the resources that you need. Next slide. Um, we are having weekly calls to share information, determine if there are any unmet needs, and put together guidance for our 911 professionals. Please let us know if there are any suggestions for resources and guidance you may need. Again, you can email me directly at aheinze at nina.org, and we will work to meet those needs. On our first call, the group identified that a, a COOP template would be really helpful for those PSAPs who don't already have one in place. So the National 911 Office went to work and built a COOP template for COVID-19 pandemic response plan. The document was drafted to provide an outline for PSAPs or ECCs to use to compose their own COVID coops. That template should be available later this week, and as soon as it is, we will get it posted to our resource page. Next page, next slide. Um, so this, as COVID-19 continues to evolve, Consistent interaction among 911, EMS, public health, and emergency management agencies is essential. The need for specific screening questions for 911 callers will continue to evolve. As many of you already know, those questions have already changed. A few weeks ago, we were asking if, um, if people had traveled, and now we're starting to see that those questions are being removed. Um, the EMS response to 911 calls are also evolving and may now include alternative care instructions, like instructing callers to contact their primary care physicians or health departments. Um, we're seeing in some areas that they're even starting to bring in a paramedic into the, the PSAP to answer specific questions, um, and so on. Next slide. Um, PSAPs need to be diligent in watching for guidance from national and state authorities during this time. Um, we want to ensure that our actions are current and relevant, and it's strongly recommended that all agencies involved in the response establish a consistent mechanism for interaction as soon as possible. That is if you already don't have that in place. So um, you need to be looking to your state 911 office for guidance, stay in contact with your local medical control authority, and work with your local emergency managers who can assist you in staying in contact with public health. If you're not already aware of who your state 911 point of contact is, you can go to the NASNA website, which is nasna911.org forward slash state 
911 contacts. And 911 does not have hyphens in it. There will be impacts on our operations and employees. Those impacts are going to continue to evolve. It's going to be key for us to stay flexible and understanding of the information that's being provided to us through our trusted resources. As Jameson touched on earlier, a few minutes ago, but I want to remind everyone, Nina has a webpage that is dedicated to the health and wellness of our 911 professionals. As the situation continues to unfold, we will need to stay mindful of the mental health of our employees. And you can find that resource at nina.org forward slash wellness continuum. Both the NINA COVID-19 and the NINA Continuum websites are free and open to everyone. NINA continues to be the partner that you have always trusted. We appreciate that trust and your time as we all weather this storm together. Now let's answer some of your questions and concerns. Thank you, April. and. Uh... John and Jameson as well. And uh, thank you everyone for being on the line with us today. We have a lot of questions that have come in already and uh, we'll answer as many of these as we can. I know we only have uh, nine minutes scheduled, but we'll be, I think, happy to stay on the line as uh, long as we can um, to get all these questions answered. So if you have a question for any of our presenters, uh, use that GoToWebinar interface and we will get them answered for you. And of course, uh, I know some of these questions might be sensitive, so uh, we'll keep them confidential. Uh, a couple of people have asked where the post-tragedy uh, care checklist lives, and it is available on that uh, Continuum Wellness Resource Portal. You can see the web address right there, nina.org slash continuum, and of course our uh, COVID-19 webpage as well, nina.org slash COVID-19. So with that, uh, let's jump into the first question. For those PSAPs formed under an intergovernmental Intergovernmental Cooperation Act, should the PSAP board also declare an emergency as it may impact the CBA and HR issues? John? Yes, if, if um, you have a local governing board uh, for your PSAP or your dispatch uh, authority, I would recommend that they also declare that emergency. Thanks. How can we find out if a specific PSAP is a HIPAA covered entity? Um, bottom line is that most, if not all, PSAPs are not covered by HIPAA. The ones that are, are captive to private or public ambulance companies. So in other words, if your dispatch center only dispatches ambulances and nothing else, you are then probably a healthcare entity covered by HIPAA. Outside of that, if you dispatch police, fire, EMS, or any combination of those, the HIPAA Act, you are not a, a, a provider as that act anticipates. Great, thank you. Uh, could someone repeat the guidance and source about asking all callers about COVID-19 symptoms? I think that we have a resource there on the uh, COVID-19 resources page. Uh, from IAD that list those out, if I answer that correctly. Are centers allowed to share names of people who are out sick because they have flu-like symptoms and are getting tested? Uh, center employees, I would say not. Um, I think in, in, internal to the center, I think you let employees know that an employee is um, possibly suffering from the virus or has been diagnosed, but I would avoid using names. Outside the center, uh, again, I think the most recent guidance from the uh, United States Department of Justice Civil Rights Division is we can use those names. I know some health departments are asking that uh, dispatch centers place identified or diagnosed coronavirus patients in their uh, CAD notes or in some kind of a uh, a premise note uh, so that that information can be given to responders. But internal to the center, I would avoid using names. Thanks. If an employee calls in sick, can you require a COVID-19 test prior to return? I, I, I don't think you can require a COVID-19 test at the moment because the 
um, ability to test is limited to physician required or health department required. And, and simply being, and, and I think this is one of the things that the uh, CDC and the public health authorities are stressing is they don't want everybody being tested for COVID-19. So, so the fact that an employee calls off sick uh, without something more, and that would be either exposure to a diagnosed case or uh, uh, the symptoms as um, uh, public health has documented them uh, and their doctor's order for a test, I don't think we can require a test. Are there provisions in place when employees have exhausted all leave banks and do not yet qualify for catastrophic leave? You know, that's that's going to be a individual determination by the employing entity, whether your individual uh, community, um, um, county, state, whatever it might be, has those kinds of provisions. There are no general um, um, federal or state provisions that I know of that mandate some kind of um, covered paid leave in the event the employee is out of exhausts all of their accrued paid leave. Do you recommend splitting staff if the backup PSAP is another ECC? Uh, Say that one more time, Chris. Sorry, it's a, the question is, do you recommend splitting staff if the backup PSAP is at another ECC? Yeah, go ahead, Ty. I think you had a pretty good idea about the keeping it sterile. Go ahead. Yeah, so I think it's uh, dependent upon the situation. Um, I think there's opportunities where splitting staff uh, is a good idea. I think there's also uh, a, a an argument that could be made that if you have a backup PSAP or a backup center, the idea of keeping it as a sterile place so that you're not potentially contaminating it. So if the uh, situation arises that you do have an infection within your ranks and you do have to evacuate and you do have to go to someplace else, that you have that capability of going to a sterile location that hasn't been contaminated and you can survive there for uh, however long it will take for the uh, original location to be uh, cleaned and uh, deemed worthy to go back to. So I think that it it is a set of circumstances that is going to have to play out in each individual agency, but I think that there's opportunities to look at it from uh, multiple different uh, points of view, uh, and you're just gonna have to evaluate those criteria and really where you are in comparison to um, maybe some of the major outbreaks that may have an influence over it versus where you are if you're, you, you only have a few cases in and around you. You may look at things differently than an agency that is on the very front lines of these types of, uh, uh, where there's a number of cases. So I think it, it just really depends. Well, thank you, Todd. All right, John, uh, this question for you. How would you recommend the actual physical uh, taking of temperatures be done? Uh, the director or assistant director will not always be present. Should it be left to shift supervisors as employee, employees enter the center? Um, certainly, I would try to limit the people that have the um, authority to conduct the, the, the screening, the temperature taking. Um, if, if the director or assistant director is not available, then a, I would try to use a designated shift supervisor so that we don't have it um, uh, distributed amongst many people. And again, this is for uh, privacy and confidentiality concerns. One other thing I think that's important uh, to remind uh, uh, center employees is if you are taking people's temperatures, please wear gloves and, and dispose of the gloves after each person you touch. That would be something that your uh, medical providers might um, w want you to uh, to do. 
With a state of emergency declaration, uh, will FEMA reimburse any costs of cleaning the center if an outside company has to be brought in? What uh, what FEMA is going to reimburse, I think, is a big question for everybody. Um, in talking with people who um, um, are in the emergency response field, both police, fire, EMS, and 911 centers, I think everybody's kind of waiting to see what FEMA is going to say they'll reimburse. So at this present time, no decision has been made, and I think we'll have to watch for what FEMA might release as guidelines uh, to the states through your state EMA for uh, reimbursement. Thanks, John. Um, and what, someone asked, what temperature would be a uh, cause of concern for an employer? Um, I don't think any of us are doctors and, and uh, none of us play them on TV. What I have read is that temperature, uh, everybody says 98.6 is, is, is um, normal, but that might fluctuate by as more than a degree either way. So somebody could be 97.6 up to 90, 99.6. Um, what I've told people, my guideline is if it's 100 or more, um, then that might be a signal. But again, you might want to check that with your uh, local Department of Public Health. So now we have a, a question, a uh, comment followed by a question. Uh, most of my employees are volunteering to remain at the 911 center for 14 days. We recently set up sleeping accommodations, food, and other supplies. Have you heard of any other agencies doing a 14-day on and 14-day off schedule where they are locked down in the center? I haven't heard of anybody doing that. I haven't either. But it sounds kind of cool. I, uh, Chris, I have heard that discussed, but I am not uh, personally aware of anybody who's doing it. Uh, how should you handle uh, an employee who took time off to self-quarantine, putting the division in hardship? Um, if that uh, self-quarantine was not based on medical recommendation, I think that employee would have to use their own uh, personal paid leave time. And if they're out of paid leave time, then I believe they would go unpaid during that time. So yeah, that dovetails into the next question. So if an employee doesn't have enough sick time, uh, you would not be obligated to pay them? No. No, there is nothing that, again, outside of the application of uh, HR 6201, which is not effective yet, um, and, and again, it's an employer's choice, a public uh, um, uh, emergency responder employer, as to whether or not they want to uh, apply the, uh, that act. But absent that, uh, there is no obligation to pay them. Uh, can you repeat what you said earlier um, about what a supervisor can ask an employee when they call in sick when it doesn't relate to coronavirus? Typically, again, outside of the emergency circumstances, um, you know, let's, you know, take our time machine back to uh, uh, 2019. On a sick call, uh, uh, the ADA and court decisions will allow you to ask the nature of the illness. So what kind of illness is it? Um, and how long the employee might be absent from work. And those are allowed specifically to allow um, um, public safety authorities to plan for staffing. And that's what the, the courts and, and the um, EEOC have held in those cases. If an employee in a PSAP tests positive, should moving uh, the agency's operations to another center be the first step? The concern is that others uh, might be incubating the disease uh, during the move, does the risk outweigh the benefit? In, in the one experience that I've had with this, um, the agency that was affected by the diagnosed um, coronavirus case um, made sure that employees who were not present in the center with that employee were the ones that went to the other center. Because that, as um, noted by the questioner, is a big concern. Why? Do I want to expose my people in my center to uh, infection? So in this case, the um, uh, center that was affected made sure that it was employees who had, had, had not had any contact with either the center or the um, uh, employee 
that was diagnosed, you know, in, in a relatively, you know, for a day or two in terms of contract with the, contact with the center. Uh, another question, uh, someone wants confirmation that HR uh, 6201 is not mandatory for 911 centers. Um, as best as I can read that law, I do not believe it is mandatory. There is a specific exception for emergency responders. However, it doesn't define emergency responders. My argument is that based on other definitions of that term contained in federal law, that in fact 911 center personnel would be uh, defined as emergency responders and that the provisions of uh, uh, HR 6201 would be voluntary on their uh, uh, personnel. But the details still have to be posted somewhere in the center, correct? Yes, you still have to post the, um, the uh, a, a not warning and notification uh, card. And if an agency did choose to comply, uh, would they be able to seek federal reimbursement? Right now, the law contains a disqualifier for local government seeking reimbursement. Um, I know here in the state of Illinois, the Illinois Municipal League, which is a, a group that represents local government employers, has written letters to our state senators or our United States senators and our Congress people asking that the Department of Labor reconsider the um, reimbursement re requirements to allow local government to be reimbursed. As the law was written and enacted uh, by the president's signature on March 18th, it does not allow local government to be reimbursed. That may change as may some of the other provisions of this law as the Department of Labor promulgates its rules or as they take it back to Congress for amendment. And John, can you uh, repeat one more time where you uh, got your, your definition of uh, who's covered as a essential personnel emergency responder? So, so it's actually three different places. Number one is in the uh, 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 Department of Homeland Security, the uh, Critical Infrastructure and Security uh, Administration uh, issued a memo on March the 19th that specifically included 911 center call personnel as critical infrastructure. The United States Department of Transportation in the Code of Regulations interpreting the Federal Railway Act um, uh, defines an emergency responder, which is the same term used in HR 6201, to include um, other organizations involved with public safety in charge of providing or coordinating emergency services. And I think clearly that would be uh, the 911 center. And then finally, in the uh, uh, FEMA law, FEMA Act, uh, they have for a long time used the term emergency response provider. Now, again, it's not emergency responder, but I would say it's pretty close. And there they have included um, public safety, which I think includes uh, 911 centers and related personnel agencies and authorities, which clearly uh, includes 911 centers. So it's based on looking at those three um, external d definitions that I would interpret um, the term emergency responder as used in HR 6201 to include 911 centers. Cool, thanks. Uh, I understand we're, we're already over time. Thank you to everyone who's hung on the line with us. We're gonna answer uh, three more questions and uh, after those, we'll wrap the webinar. We'll be getting the uh, on-demand archive version as well as a copy of the slide deck out to you shortly thereafter. And uh, we'll include some, some more information uh, from Nina and uh, a couple email addresses to, to uh, you know, get in touch with us should you have any additional follow-up questions for uh, the presenters. So uh, first question, uh, are any changes being made to questions being asked for law enforcement calls? And Ty or April? So this is Ty. Um, I think what we've been seeing across the country uh, that every every set of questions now uh, seems to be starting with these types of questions. I think the reality of understanding we have a responsibility to inform 
law enforcement uh, who are going out on incidents. Um, we've heard in a couple different scenarios and a couple different instances where um, they're asking those questions and if anyone presenting with any of those uh, signs and symptoms, uh, they're asking that they meet the law enforcement officers outside uh, so that the officers are not having to go into a confined uh, home or business where people are exhibiting those um, signs and symptoms. So in a lot of scenarios, a lot of centers, agencies are adding those questions uh, to all uh, sets of questions uh, that are starting any on any call. And, and you also need to make sure you're reaching out to your local um, medical control because they may have specific pieces of information that they need for their EMS responders. Um, and they're, they're dictating what the local EMS agencies, how they're going to respond. So um, it's important to be working with all of those entities. Like I mentioned earlier on, you need to be checking with med control, you need to be talking to public health, you need to be talking to your local agencies and ensuring that their needs are being met. That will drive the questions that you're asking. Is there a place to get a draft letter for employees to have them in case they are stopped by police during a, a stay at home order? The advice I've seen on that, Chris, is that employees should have their uh, work ID available if possible. Um, and again, that's probably going to differ state to state depending upon the nature of the governor's order uh, relative to stay at home and how they define essential services and industries. I have not heard of anybody in public safety being questioned about responding, but I, I would think that uh, you know your ID would probably uh, uh, be sufficient there. Uh, and I think our also for, steps. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, Chris, if I could add that uh, what we're also hearing from around the country is that in most uh, jurisdictions, there's no uh, proactive enforcement of these types of, uh, of stay at home orders. Um, unless it's large events and or um, groups. Uh, that seems to be the one where uh, law enforcement is actually going in and trying to, to break them up. But uh, we have not seen proactive enforcement of, on, in most cases, uh, of the stay at home orders. Really quick, two final questions. Uh, if um, there's a staffing issue, are centers obligated to approve time off for self-quarantine? Um, I would say if that self-quarantine is, is not ordered by a doctor, I do not think you have to approve time off. If it's ordered by a doctor, then you probably are gonna have to let them off um, and then make other arrangements. And the last question, uh, when screening staff, doing medical screenings, would it be best to have someone with a medical background perform those screenings? I, I would say yes, but I, I'm, I'm good luck finding somebody uh, given the uh, demand on uh, medical resources we're under right now. Well, John, I wanna thank you, Jameson, uh, April and Ty as well. Uh, this is an excellent webinar. I wanna thank everyone for being here. Please uh, remember to use Nina's resources, the COVID-19 page you see there on your screen, as well as our Continuum uh, Wellness Portal. We're constantly updating both of those with new information as we have it. Like I said, we'll be getting the archive information out to everyone uh, as soon as we can, uh, later this afternoon or early evening. And of course, uh, follow and like us on social media for the latest updates when new resources and um, events like this will be available, uh, they'll be posted to our social stuff as well. So uh, thank you everyone. I hope you're all uh, staying well and staying safe and uh, we appreciate the work you're doing and uh, continue to reach out to us and use us as a resource. Thanks everyone.
Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.